uh, censorship, uh, shunning, whatever term you want to use for it, uh, in, in, this, in our day and age, particularly in the context, but not exclusively in the context of uh, the, the social media. So tonight we have three members who are going to talk about different aspects of this topic. Our incoming president, Ken Norton over here. Uh, Norris, sorry. I was, that's right, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I, I'm getting it. Yeah, hey, I've, I've had a glass of wine, so forgive me. So anyway, so Ken Norris is gonna take over as our moderator. Uh, and our panelists this evening, uh, we will address different aspects of the topic. Uh, it will include our treasurer, Dave, over here. Who is going, I'm not, I'm not going to say your last name, Dave, because I'm, yeah, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing here, as we just saw with Ken. Uh, so, uh, but, yeah, but, uh, but Dave is, is going to be talking about specifically the topic of, uh, of the problem of censorship and banning in the age of the social media. Uh, our very handy uh, AV and IT tech guy here, uh, Andy Lowe, is going to talk about the, the, with respect to the social media and how it might be impacted by federal regulations and laws uh, that address uh, what may or may not be or how it may, you may control uh, public, uh, published, uh, publicized information. And finally, looking at it from a more traditional perspective, uh, that of libraries and librarians. Uh, we have uh, a distinguished retired uh, librarian from the Western Michigan University, uh, David Isaacson, uh, who will address that topic. So I'm going to talk uh, turn it over to Dave. Our speakers have been, please, asked to hold themselves to five to seven minutes because what we want is input from all of you. Your shared comments, your shared questions, uh, and the only thing we would say is we hope that there are divergent and viewpoints this evening, but we also hope that everyone will be respectful of opinions with which you may or may not agree. So that's the last you're going to hear from me. So the mic's not on, Howard. Okay, okay, I'm okay because I I thought I had it close enough. I after a full year of being your president, you would think I learned how to use this thing. So. Anyway, um, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Ken, and we're going to uh, get this con uh, this conversation going. That's it. Yeah, let's have a hand for Tom, our president, for the last year. Thanks, Tom. And uh, as Tom said, we have three presenters, basically, and then after the presentations, what? Go this way. It reminds me of an old thing, so walk this way and then, yeah. Uh, so there'll be three presentations. Like Tom said, Andy will be first to present us the, the law. There's a primary statute that applies to the social media platforms that, that you know, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. So he's gonna inform us on that so we all have an understanding of that, get our knowledge level base there. Uh, and, and then Dave, right, or you first, Dave. Dave goes first. Okay. Got it. And when we open it up to the membership, I'll be acting as a facilitator. The idea is to pull out of you ideas that you think would be potential means to, let's say, uh, mitigate the negatives and maximize the positives. Okay, so Dave Omart. I was hoping for a microphone. Can everybody hear me? That um, I could just consult my notes periodically. Tonight's topic is free speech and censorship in the age of social media. Closer. Is that better? Is that better? Birds of a feather flock together. 
my grandmother always said that. And what she was alluding to is that we tend to associate with people who are like us. Early human survival depended on the integrity of the tribe, which always depended on the dynamic between the individual free speech and the good of the group censorship. They, those two existed in dynamic tension. And whether the group is a tribe or a church or a nation, you will see that dynamic tension. Free speech is important, so important that the founders of our country made freedom of speech the First Amendment in the Constitution. But as you might imagine, there have always been guardrails uh, in the way in the way of self-censorship, because we need that to maintain the integrity of the group, whether that group is the people you work with, the church, social organizations, or so on. But in the last 10 or so years, we've seen a weakening of these guardrails. Uh, church attendance has fallen, uh, social clubs, nobody joins them anymore. And within the last few years, we've encountered two major disruptions. The first major disruption was the increasing use of social media, which is related to the second major disruption, which was COVID. And when COVID came, all the guardrails came off because all of our social groups closed down. Our schools closed down, churches closed down, we worked remotely, and we had nothing but social media. We became a society without guardrails, free speech without limits. And we have seen the symptoms of this societal collapse. Uh, we've seen a increase in anxiety and depression in our children. A recent article in the Journal of American Medical Association said or reported that there's been a 30% increase in anxiety and depression in our children. And I think we can view our children as the canaries in the coal mine. When a, carry, when a canary gets sick in the coal mine, we don't blame the canary. The problem is the coal mine. You can take the canary out of the coal mine and the canary will get better. But you put him back in a coal mine, he gets sick. The problem is not with the canary and we have to watch where we're going with our children. The other thing that we've noticed is the increase in violence in our society with all kinds of weapons, but also the violence in our speech. As you may have gathered, I am not a free speech absolutist like Elon Musk described himself until he found out that every move he made could be tracked in social media. And then he tempered his outlook somewhere. I view free speech as I do access to guns. You cannot count on me to defend your right to bear arms down to our last dead kindergartner or the last kid who mistakenly rings the, door, the wrong doorbell or the last college student that accidentally drives up the wrong driveway. As a result of our twin fetishes with free speech and guns, we come to the people in this room where each of you and your relatives and your loved ones can be only one trip to Walmart away from being involved in a mass shooting. Today, what we want to do is call your ideas for how we can establish the guardrails, the self-censorship that has always been part of our society from, from the beginning of the human race until now. I will be followed by David Isaacson, who has thoughts on free speech and censorship. 
and he will be followed by Andy Lowe, who will tell us how the f uh, creators of social media have uh, been able to escape responsibility and grow rich um, by having no guardrails whatsoever on social media. I have, uh, I will start when you, when we get to where you're giving us your ideas, we will have Ken write them on the whiteboard. And I'll start with the first idea. And the first idea is do nothing. Because doing nothing is doing something. And it's what we've done so far. You may agree that doing nothing is is a good idea, uh, that maybe we don't have any problem at all. And if that's true, we would like to hear from you. But at this point, I'm going to turn the podium over to David Isaacson. Yay, David. Oh, there we go. My microphone. Am I being heard? Thank you. Well, that was eloquent. Uh, we didn't talk much between us, so a few of my points have already been raised, and that's good. That'll leave more time for conversation discussion. Uh, I'd like to provide a little philosophical uh, background to my uh, ruminations on this subject. My background was first five years of college teaching, followed by 33 years here uh, at the university as a reference and then humanities librarian. Um, I started teaching in 1966. A lot of stuff was going, going on, some of you remember. Uh, I wasn't quite a flower child. I was a new instructor at McMurray College, Jacksonville, Illinois. I had a class that was two things at once, an introduction to literature and uh, composition. They had to write compositions about poems, short stories, uh, and a couple plays. Well, I, I, I was young, and mm, some people might say fearless, some people might say reckless. Uh, I decided, kind of spur of the moment, to get the students' attention when we started discussing uh, Sophocles' famous play, Oedipus Rex. So I said, well, I hope you've read this play. You all know it's a play about a motherfucker. I got everybody's attention, including my own. This was my first year of teaching, but it was 1960, maybe it was 1965. At any rate, I immediately followed that. I said, uh, this is a certain context. Uh, we can discuss Freud's point of view on this, and we're going to discuss how this is a tragedy. I used that kind of language, that register of language, for a reason, because I believe, I have, I know I have something called academic freedom, which in my mind and many others uh, is a larger freedom than we enjoy in the First Amendment. We have a lot of freedom under the First Amendment, uh, generally speaking, partly from a legal point of view, Justice Holmes' famous uh, restriction. We, we have a right to say almost anything except fire in a crowded theater when there is no fire. Well, I think academic freedom is larger even than that because in the context of a university or a college, and I would argue any school, high school, even 
even lower. The part of the teaching enterprise, in fact, the most important part of it, is the search for truth. What is real? All the more important these days is when, when we're subject to so much not only misinformation, but disinformation. So we need academic freedom uh, in that context in order to freely explore what's going on, what is true, what's not true. That was my argument, my defense, anyway. Uh, when we think of censorship, we think of, I think, of, well, a sliding scale. Uh, do nothing, <laughs> uh, on the one hand, uh, and then the scale goes up. Well, and, and this was true uh, in my experience as a librarian, which we couldn't have all, you can't, no library, even the Library of Congress can't have every publication ever. Just, there's, just, there's no room and there's no reason to have everything. So you, you have certain uh, rules or guidelines is a better word for selecting. Well, don't we all have that uh, in our speech too? Uh, there's such a thing as good taste. Uh, my my words of, of my shocking uh, words a few moments ago would not be considered good taste in in many circumstances. I realize that. Okay, so we do, most of us, even Lenny Bruce, uh, at times, uh, decided that he wasn't going to say certain things. So we, we choose. I don't, you could call that self-censorship, but um, I think a better word is just selection, choosing, good taste, bad taste. Oh, or maybe what you can get away with in a certain context. What's more persuasive from an emotional point of view or what's more logical from an argumentative point of view. So, <laughs> censorship is distinctly different from selection. And censorship takes many different forms, and we're going to hear more about them uh, tonight. Uh, what we're seeing these days, as most of you know, uh, and it, it, it follows uh, from what has just been said, the, uh, the presumed absolute freedom of the Internet and so-called social media, which is, of course, often not social at all, anti-social. It, it, it's a media, their Twitter, the Twitterverse uh, leads, you know, people, people presumably can say anything they want. And we are in trouble because a lot of what's being said not only is not true, but it, it, it's, there's certain forms of danger, uh, depending on what's said. Now, in, from my experience as an academic librarian, uh, we, didn't, it, we didn't have any censor board uh, saying we couldn't have certain books in our library or certain other forms of publication. Uh, but as you know, uh, book banning is becoming ever more uh, frequent and dangerous, I think, to uh, the, the exploration of what's true. Then you get into this really wonderfully gray area of people who have the right, parents, for instance, to, they think, choose, well, they know, they can choose what 
what their children are reading at home, of course. But then they want to choose what the kids can be uh, experiencing either in classrooms or, or in libraries. And that's led to not only some restrictions, but some outright banning. And not only uh, books that already have been published, uh, very controversial ones like uh, Huck, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which uh, often is not read because of the prevalence of the N-word, which is not meant in a pre Twain didn't mean it in a prejudiced way at all. It's just that's what uh, Negro Jim, Tom's friend, uh, and that's how he's known in that context. So censorship is one thing. Selection is another. There is a purist point of view, and then there's you know, various uh, restrictions on that so-called purity. And um, I, I, I would argue distinctly different environment that we enjoy under the First Amendment in this country. Uh, and then the even larger context of academic freedom. Uh, I think my last point is that I find it so ironic that often, a res not simply restrictions, but outright bannings uh, occur more often uh, on the left, which ought to know better, as well as on the right, uh, so-called trigger warnings. Uh, an excess of what is sometimes called political correctness. So I think this is, this is not my field, but it, 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 things are different in, in the world of uh, the internet than they were earlier. You may remember back in 1964, Marshall McLuhan famously said, the media is the message. And he meant, and he argued this uh, quite persuasively, that television uh, changed, television and film changed how we absorbed, consumed, understood information. Uh, it was distinctly different from the print media. Well, Marshall McLuhan has become old-fashioned in, 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 in our day. He, he couldn't really anticipate uh, the benefits and the dangers of social media. I've got an article, an essay that I'd like to write. I've been gathering ideas, but I haven't written it yet. But I have the title, I Give My Finger to the Digital World. All right, can everybody hear me? OK, good. Give me two seconds. I have to turn on the digital world. And then I'll do this because I don't sit in this chair. So there we go. All right, so uh, when we were talking about, when I first heard this in the um, board meeting, I was like, okay, we're talking about freedom of speech and social media. Who's going to talk about Section 230? And they all just stared at me like going, um, what's that? So Section 230, it's kind of the current law of the land. First thing, some uh, quotes by Republicans on Section 230. This one. Very big words, very long. This was kind of what got the ball rolling most recently, and it was supposedly said by Donald Trump, but this was all in writing. As you can see, it's an actual sentence. Sorry, I just had to. He did it to himself. Oh, OK, maybe I should have done bigger font. All right, I will read this. Section 230 was not intended to allow a handful of companies to grow into titans, controlling vital avenues of our national discourse under the guise of promoting open forums for debate, and then to provide these behemoths blanket immunity 
when they use their power to censor content and silence viewpoints that they, ha that they dislike. This was done in an executive order that he had uh, called for the Department of Justice to do investigations into social media companies. Um, but he was not the first Republican. This one says Section 230 has been interpreted so broadly that bad Samaritans can skate by without accountability. We must ensure platforms are held reasonably accountable for activity on their platforms. Bob Lotta back in 2019. So like I said, Donald Trump was not the first person to talk about this. He was just the loudest. But so you think, okay, Republicans are against Section 230. Democrats must be for it. Well, somebody said Section 230 should be revoked, immediately should be revoked, number one. That was Joe Biden, actually, during the uh, presidential campaign in 2020. And then somebody else said, I do think that for the privilege of 230, there has to be a bigger sense of responsibility on it, and it is not out of the question that it could be removed. Nancy Pelosi said that in 2019, being, you know, from California, the heart of Silicon Valley, that one was taken, uh, Silicon Valley did not like it when she said that. And then this was actually, the, this was the most recent one that I had found. Um, Section 230 dates from a time when the internet was a young, necessant startup kind of venture that needed protection if it tried to weed out the bad stuff, and now it's used to defend keeping the bad stuff there. This was during one of the, um, I do believe this was a house committee where they tried to bring uh, Meta and Google and everybody in to discuss the, what their thoughts were on Section 230. Which is kind of funny, trying to find quotes on Section 230 was really hard because politicians either talk about Silicon Valley or the tech giants or name individual companies. Trying to find somebody actually saying the words Section 230 was like pulling teeth. So what is Section 230? Well, this all stems from a Telecommunications Act of 1996, which before 1996, the last telecommunication laws that the United States passed was in 1934. So a lot had changed from 34 all the way up to 96. And uh, just so you know, it passed the Republican-controlled House and Senate, and it was signed into law by Bill Clinton. So this was a bipartisan bill that just covered a lot of stuff. There were seven major parts, communication services. This was actually landline phones. Who still has a landline? I know I'm asking the wrong crowd on that one, sorry. Uh, broadcast services, so this is um, TV, radio, satellite stuff, cable services, um, which actually there was a cable communications policy of 84, which even back then, these are Things have changed so much. Regulatory reform. This one here, though, the obscenity and violence section. This is where the Communications Decency Act is. This is where Section 230 is. So it's even in the middle of all this. There's other laws and miscellaneous provisions, which I found funny. This is actually where the cell phone rules and regulations were stored. Because back in 1996, cell phone uh, penetration was only 16%. Now it's actually 104%. So there are people out there who have, oh, I don't have my other cell phone on me. I think it's over there, who have more than one cell phone. So there's actually more cell phone penetration than there is people. So, okay, so breaking down the Communication Decency Act of 1996. So, okay, so we're big telecom overarching law. Now we're into the one section where it's Section 230 is. This was originally a Senate bill introduced back during the whole regulation and figuring out what to put in the Telecom Act. This one contained 12 sections. Uh, so there was the title, obscenities, obscene programming, scrambling of cable channels, scrambling of sexually explicit. There's a lot of obscene stuff in these first six sections, which funny is the fact that um, after this was passed, I think it was the ACLU brought up a uh, lawsuit against it, and actually the Supreme Court found these first six sections to be uh, unconstitutional. So all this stuff that they had done there um, got wiped out, which is funny because Section 7, which is actually where Section 230 is of Title V of the tele this is getting down in there. Um, this is actually where 230 is. This was actually not in the original Senate bill. When the House passed their version, the Senate passed their version, it always goes into committee to try and, you know, 
hammer out the, the differences between the two of them. During that committee section is when they took a House bill and kind of just jammed it onto the end of the Senate bill and called it the Communications Decency Act. So nobody in the Senate actually had any debate on this or voted on this at all. This was just part of the House bill, and then everybody had to vote on it once it was actually in the final thing there. So this is, this is the key one right there. Um, coercion and incitement of minors, online, oh, sorry, online family empowerment. There is the section, sorry, not section seven, section nine of Title V of section seven of the Telecommunications Act. Yeah, you're getting down in here. There's a lot of stuff in here, a lot of things, but this is the actual section 230, and all the stuff I'm not gonna read because this is not the actual law. This is just the preamble of the actual law, and then there is a second preamble of the actual law. And here we finally get to the actual law, which I've underlined here, and if you're counting, that is 26 words. So this whole thing that we're having, of yes, I will actually read the 26 words. No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. 26 words, which everybody, there's actually people who've written books that say the 26 words that started the internet. This is those 26 words that they're talking about. And then there's also a second section on there, which is basically the Good Samaritan section saying that no provider of uh, any sort of interactive computer service shall be held liable on account of actually trying to do something. So they can't be held liable for actually trying to moderate what they are, you know, what people are posting on there, because there were actually two court cases that basically caused Section 230 to come into existence. First one was in 1991, Cubby versus CompuServe. Uh, a columnist for CompuServe said something bad about a competitor. The competitor sued CompuServe for libel. But the federal courts found that since CompuServe did zero moderation, no moderation whatsoever of their servers, they couldn't be held, li they couldn't be held for libel because they had no knowledge of it ahead of time. But then, 1995, Stratton Oakmont versus Prodigy. Somebody, nobody knows to this day who it was, posted on the Prodigy bulletin board saying, hey, Stratton Oakmont, is doing some shady stuff. Stratton Oakmont said, wait a second, no, you can't say that. We're not doing shady stuff. We're going to sue you for liable. Um, the S New York Supreme Court said, and I'm going to read this section because this is exactly what came from the court document, that because Prodigy moderated its online message boards and deleted some messages for offensiveness and bad taste, the court found that it had become akin to a publisher with responsibility for defamation postings and made it onto the site. Now this is my part. At the time, Prodigy received 60,000 postings per day. They only reviewed just a minimal amount, like I, they said, just for offensiveness and bad taste. But because they were still moderating some content, they can be held for liable. And they are liable for all posts, even if they weren't moderating all the posts. The uh, fun fact, though, is, um, it's kind of hard to read down here, but those libel statements actually turned out to be true. Uh, if anybody has seen the movie Wolf of Wall Street, that is Stratton Oakmont. So yes, they were doing some shady stuff. Somebody told on them and they tried to sue for libel and won, but they were actually doing it. So yeah, fun stuff. Um, there are actually currently two court cases at the Supreme Court and Justice Kagan said during one of them that these are not like the nine greatest experts on the internet, which got a, quite a chuckle from the crowd inside the courtroom there. So there's the first case that they heard on Wednesday, the 28th of February, I think, or 27th of February, something in that range. Gonzalez versus Google. Gonzalez was a female college student who was killed in an ISIS attack in Paris in 2015. Her family filed a lawsuit that alleges Google, who owns YouTube, violated the Anti-Terrorism Act by recommending ISIS videos through its algorithms, therefore aiding ISIS's recruitment. So she said this was an anti-terrorism, you know, this was a terroristic act, so she had sued Google for that. 
The issue in front of the court was whether Section 230, those 26 words, provides algorithm, oh, sorry, protects algorithms that recommend third-party content. So rather than just moderating, the question was in front of the court whether or not algorithms themselves are a protected thing. Listening to the oral arguments, the surprising fact was the amount of, or actually lack of questions on the actual text of 230. For the amount of questions they had during the Dobbs case about text and historical accuracy and textualists and all that things there, I think there were two or three questions about the actual text of the law. And the question, you know, nobody was really concerned on the bench whether or not whatever this was was actually against the written word of the law. Most of it was musings about upsetting the status quo and hypothetical situations, and if we you know, rule against Google on this, what else could happen? So the, most of the judges seem to be against Gonzalez and pro-Google on this one, which is funny because Justice Thomas wrote, well, he wrote against Section 230 in a previous case, and he was, he was very skeptical about broad 230 protections in the past, yet when this case came up, he basically did a 180 from his previous positions, which surprised a lot of people. Um, Kagan and Kavanaugh both agreed that this was more of a congressional issue rather than a Supreme Court issue, which I don't think anything can actually get done in Congress right now, but that's what their thought was. And only the uh, newest justice, Justice Jackson, seemed to be actually on the side of the plaintiff. Everybody else seemed to be on the side of Google. Um, then literally the next day, they had this case, uh, Twitter versus, God, I looked up the pronunciation on this and I messed it up. Does anybody want to take a Kamina, I think? Um, which was nobody's name actually in the case, so I'm not figuring out whose name that was, but a Jordanian was killed by ISIS on a nightclub attack in Turkey in 2017. His family is American, though, uh, sued Twitter, Google, and Facebook under the Anti-Terrorism Act again, saying that Twitter's platform knowingly played an important role in ISIS's terrorism efforts, but nonetheless failed to take action to keep ISIS content off their platforms. So the issue in front of the court for this case is if tech companies can even be held liable for recommendations. So this is not even a Section 230 thing. This is just, can companies even be held liable for recommending content to everybody else? Which is funny because uh, I think it was uh, Amy Coney Barrett during the Google case brought up, well, wait a second, if we rule against the Twitter case the next day, this whole Google versus Gonzalez thing is moot because if they find that Twitter can't be held liable for recommendations, that gives Google a perfect out saying, well, then we can't be held liable for our recommendations. So they had three hours of oral arguments that was kind of summed up in one sentence going, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, most of the oral arguments during this case were trying to draw the line on what substantial assistance was, which there's a lot of justices trying to define what substantial is was, they were very mincing a lot of words on that one. Um, this was more of a cloudy outcome, so I had to kind of go to the analysts to figure out what everybody was seeing on this one. Most of them said that the justices are leaning towards Twitter, but they don't know because a lot of them are on their own personal you know, scales. So we, they think it's gonna be ruled towards Twitter's favor, but we don't know by how much. And like I said, if this one rules towards Twitter, then the other one can just get shut down without even a, a, a ruling on that one. But there are actually other two other cases about social media at the Supreme Court, well, sort of at the Supreme Court. First one is Net Choice versus Patton, Paxton, and Net Choice versus Moody. Net Choice versus Paxton is against the Texas law that bars social media platforms with at least 50 million active users from blocking, removing, or demonizing content based on the user's views. This was enacted in Texas and then promptly put, you know, had a legal challenge against it and has been put on hold by the Supreme Court. The second one is NetChoice versus Moody, which is a Florida law that would prohibit companies from deplatforming political candidates, prioritizing or deprioritizing posts 
by or about political candidates and removing any content by a journalistic enterprise. It also blocks provisions that require companies to provide a thorough rationale for every content moderation decision. This one, as soon as you know, it was enacted, was put against legal challenge. The 11th Circuit Court has blocked most of the law, not all of it. And Florida has sent this up to the Supreme Court asking for their, you know, to take up the case. And they're appealing it. Um, the justices have asked the Solicitor General to weigh in, which a lot of people kind of see as almost a delay tactic. Because they have, you know, they, they took the things they're saying, okay, we want outside opinions on this from the Department of Justice and Solicitor General and everything. So that pushes both of the cases to at least the next Supreme Court session, if not later. So who knows? We'll find out from the two current cases. Those will probably be announced next month. But these other two that are in the wings, who knows? Who knows when the Solicitor General is going to get back to the Supreme Court? Who knows if the Supreme Court is actually even going to pick him up? But that is what the current law is for social media and Section 230. So they're both on. Okay, so Andy, before you, uh, before we start with the uh, kind of interaction with the crowd, I want to uh, see if I've, if I can summarize what you just said in terms of the history a little bit and clarification. One is that Section 230, as written and as enacted in the mid 1990s, looked at social media platforms as precisely that. Yes. Platforms, kind of like your phone company. The phone company is not responsible for what you say. You know, think of old fashioned, right? I still have a landline. So the phone company, ATT, whoever your phone company is, they are not responsible for what I say to the other person on the other end and vice versa. And that's how this. Is that a good analogy? Yes, this was, in, it, a lot of people thought this along the lines of a newsstand, where the, the, the person in charge of the newsstand had no, had, wasn't liable for what was actually at the newsstand, because they were just sitting there presenting everything out there. They were not held, they, you couldn't sue the, the guy on the corner just because World News said something that was completely false. And that. Okay, but, but the idea, I think, was that they're, these are just carriers. <laughs> In other words, the original concept is that we are not controlling the content that appears on our platform. Therefore, we are not, should not be held responsible, and we should not be liable for that content. Is that accurate? Okay. But... Understand the technology is different, but the concept, the fundamental concept, is is basically that. I, I bring up the newsstand thing here because I was reading from the um, the two people who had actually created the House bill. They had filed briefs during these the the two SCOTUS trials, and they had brought up their original analogy when they were drafting. This was an was the newsstand analogy that I had brought up. So that's. I was trying to, you know, bring up the example of what they were thinking when they created these, uh, these, this word here. So I think you're right, uh, but as we look at the laws, the statute up there, how many words was it? Twenty-four or twenty-six? Twenty-six. Okay. Um, it says shall be. Treated as the uh, no provider shall be treated. I'm paraphrasing as a publisher or speaker of any information. In other words, they are not to be held responsible for the content. So where I think we've and and again, 
I'm going to ask if I'm being accurate in, in right, where things seems to have grayed up or become fuzzy is when the platforms themselves demonstrate that they are changing content, whether it's restricting content through censorship or amplifying content through an algorithm that emphasizes one party, not being political party, but one party as being someone who's presenting information on the platform versus de-amplifying or turning down the volume, if you will, as an analogy on another party. Is that accurate? That, that seems to be accurate, yes, because the, the, that was actually kind of how the, um, the Democrats against 230 are basically saying that the, um, the social media platforms have been amplifying the misinformation that's been going around recently, especially after COVID. And the Republicans have been saying that the social media platforms have been silencing their point of views on the social media platforms. So those are kind of, those are the reasonings behind both political parties. Right. But both of them seem to, in general, be saying it's time to remove the two, Section 230 protection. Yes. For, for different reasons, but they are saying the same thing as the reasons need, yes. in terms of politics, but generally for the same reason. Okay, uh, so th the idea now is is for you to give some thought, and I'm I'm gonna kind of try to put in the the other extreme. Dave put in one extreme, which I think was a, a good way to to uh, put a bookend on the low extreme, which is do nothing with regard to the. Uh, First, uh, the balance between First Amendment, freedom of speech, and uh, control of content, or somehow limiting, what, what would you say is the right concept here? To, to, to mitigate the, the negatives, I guess is how I think of it in generally, uh, uh, without Im imposing on freedom of speech is that well that's that's a good thing you know they, they, and maybe that's the thing what is it that we want to mitigate do you think well this is more of a question than but what do we do about um, our algorithms being used by um, for example, Russia, or someone who wants to influence our elections, um, um, using social media, um, that's not information, but so. You're thinking propaganda. Correct. Uh, just a comment about what's on about doing nothing, and that is, if the <clears throat> thank you, if if the platforms are merely utilities and are not held accountable, um, then the content very often comes from anonymous or untraceable sources. And the result then is total lack of accountability. So can you sue the platform? Well, no, in certain circumstances. But then who do you hold accountable um, for misinformation or libel that does damage given the anonymous nature of the a lot of the uh, information there. So I don't know if this is even possible, but it seems as if if we're not to hold the platforms accountable, then it would be great if we could find a way to identify who is participating or where the information comes from. So, okay, 
So, I, so what I'm going to do now is kind of list concerns over here. Okay, so number two would be make sure that anything that is posted it comes from an identifiable or verified uh, speaker, if you will say. It, it, okay. Identify. And so the concept here is to make sure we know the source. Oh, so we need someone who is the Ministry of Facts. Hmm. Well, okay. Oh, well, you just said yeah. sometimes it is. So who has the right to say, no, you're wrong? I, I, I'm not saying you can't verify. The question is, so, so would you say that perhaps on a far extreme would be, let's establish a ministry of truth. And no one's allowed to put anything on the platform without a minister. Is that an extreme? Oh. Okay, so let me be clear on what I'm doing. Dave put up one extreme, nothing. Do you agree this is about as extreme as we could come up with, Ministry of Truth? Can anybody think of anything more extreme than that? Not that we want it, but now we know what the bookends are. Well, uh, right, Dave? Um, well, yes, I, I think there's something worse than the Ministry of Truth I believe that was the actual name of this um, horribly censorious um, ministry in uh, Oro's famous novel, 1984. Worse than that was that people began so to censor themselves that they, they wouldn't utter anything. They didn't, e e after a while, they didn't need a ministry because they were doing it to themselves. And the language itself was very interesting. You could not say bad. There were simply degrees. You could say good, double plus good, or double plus ungood. You could not say the word bad. So the, the thinking was worse than the, um, But if we're looking at structural impositions, can you think of something worse than this? And I agree with you. I think what that results in is something even worse. Okay. Well, I wanted to uh, return to the idea of what we could do. That's uh, uh, kind of in that goes, goes along in that first column where you have one, two, and three. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, is this better? Okay. Uh, is it simply require that. Uh, uh, each uh, posting uh, must list uh, its source. And uh, if there are multiple sources, uh, they have to uh, 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 list, say, the, the, the top three. And then, of course, you could get into arguments about what that constitutes. But at least you, it's a way for people, by just looking at the website, they don't have to do an extra search, but it can see right from the website where to go to, to get verification. And the verification could come from the New York Times, or it could come from the Daily Beast, or it could come from Reddit. But uh, people can start to evaluate it. And, uh, and the, it, So is this coming from a source that has been around for a while that has a reputation, or is it coming from a source that has no reputation? Uh, that, I think, would be helpful. OK, so you're connecting this to this. You're connecting yes, four yes. to three. Yes. Good. 
Okay, uh, I, sorry. I, I presume I'm not the only person that saw this morning's Kalamazoo Gazette, uh, but the lead article pointed out that Finland has addressed misinformation for decades because of their proximity to Russia and their attempts to uh, alter the truth uh, for their citizens. And they pointed out that they start in kindergarten with education about how to use the internet and they have a definitive class. And with those two, three, and four, really five is education uh, beginning and that this is an identifiable class all the way through their, through their schooling. Can you give us some more specifics? Um, I think I've summarized what was stated in this morning's Gazette with just a couple nods, but I was impressed that our students get no training about how to identify what is real from what is unreal uh, that is posted on the internet. What, what was uh, uh, the truth and what wasn't the truth? Down there, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was anathema. Uh, and uh, other parts of the country, she was a hero. And uh, so uh, uh, I, I, I see, see problems with, uh, in this country, uh, trying to inculcate into ch children any idea of critical thinking. There will be some parents who will be mighty upset with it, the notion of what critical thinking could lead to in terms of threatening their uh, worldview, their morality, uh, uh, their uh, values. Has anyone else seen uh, proposals that we get back to teaching <coughs> civics as part of the curriculum? Well, can I got the mic over here. Can I, can I make an intervention? Please? Just to, yeah, the floor, thank you. Uh, just to get back to where our first speaker presented about the concern for the young people who are on social media. And I think we've, ca you know, we're, we're dealing with good things here, but I think it's important to remember that too and how we might approach young people's access to social media in a way that would tend to at least eliminate some of the problems we've identified. And one of the things that I've heard about recently, which I think is certainly worth discussion, maybe not tonight, but is the idea of demanding in a, a parental permission uh, to a certain age group. And some people have talked about that age group as being under 13. Others have talked about it as being under 15. But that if that parental permission is not received, then the, the uh, suppliers or the, the publishers would, if they're not publishers, I should say that, but would uh, uh, demand that, uh, and that would be a law in the, of the land. We've now gone for an hour, believe it or not. Time flies when we're having fun. So, uh, everybody good for another 10 minutes? And then we'll call it. So the last one, if I caught it right, was uh, to address children. Well, right now, the ch the age for Facebook is actually, you're not technically supposed to be on Facebook if you're under 13. That is part of their terms of service. Is it enforceable? No. I'd like to make a comment about parental permission. There's a teacher, high school teacher, sitting at the table, and tonight it was brought up that the parents aren't involved in doing anything but promoting what their children says, might say, or claim in school, and the teachers aren't much listened to anymore. So I think you're going to get parental permission to get on social media. Yeah, there. You're right. There will be. There's just going to be a spectrum of response to something like that. So I've got a proposal of my own. Let me uh, go ahead, Tom, and then I'll I'll put mine in. I guess I'm just going to ask to find social media, because we're talking about Meta, we're talking about Twitter, we're talking about Facebook, but.
but there are other platforms out there that I have no idea how to get to that deliberately conceal who is the poster. Uh, I'm, I'm talking these dark webs, these uh, media. So even if you are able to establish some kind of world, and, and I, critical thinking is, to me, is reason, you know, it's what you can prove. It's what you can establish. If you have no evidence, what you're saying is out the window. But if you've got these other sources out there, who is and how are you going to regulate them? Because I guess what I'm thinking as we see this conversation tonight is we are looking at these, if you will, Main Street, uh, middle, you know, everybody knows about. But I don't know how to get on to some of these other things, and I don't care. I don't want to get on them. I don't want to get on most of these mainstream ones. But there are people, and here's where the risk comes in, they're dangerous. They're not just talking their ideas. They're planning, plotting things that are, I may, I may support, I may. I, I, I can do that with a telephone, too. Well, exactly. Uh, yeah. So we don't outlaw telephones. What we do is we have other means of addressing it. I've got a, a proposal I want to just put up in front of you and see you know, what people think. Have, have any of you used something like uh, VRBO, Airbnb? What do they ask you to do after you stay there? Wherever, at a house. Leave a review. Give me a rating. What if we established a rating system by the users of social media? Yeah, a bot farm could take that out without any sort of complaint. Yeah, the bot farms already exist. That's that's Understood. what goes all the time. Hopefully, the smart computer people can figure out how to force. Well, what about those? You know those little puzzles you have to work to verify when you go to a bank that you're not a bot. So if if you put in the same, if you put in something, most people aren't going to know how to get around that. But a rating system where you leave individualized ratings and the rater must be capable of being this word verified. This was actually part of the speculation when uh, Elon Musk was trying was you know trying to buy Twitter and then also trying to back out of buying Twitter was the fact of the number of bots and the verification system on Twitter. This was a major contention for him at the time, and Elon Musk just lives, breathes computers. And if he can't figure this out, then it's well, that's it's, that's not necessarily a indictment of him being able to do. It's just that he was saying. Um, I don't have access to things to be able to figure out. I think there's more bots on there than I have access to be able to verify. Yes. To second the notion about education, something that's done these days in substance abuse treatment is teaching young people uh, to be savvy on the internet. Because if you consider Juul, for example, um, what Jewel did despicably was to uh, troll 13-year-olds uh, who were seeking out uh, sources where they could learn to do better at math testing, for example. It was uh, setting bait. And, yeah, and um, they also advertised their product on Nickelodeon, um, where, you know, and, and so... Part of it then just to deal with the nic tobacco or nicotine people is that uh, internet savvy, be savvy about the information. So I think that is a very helpful suggestion. Yeah, the idea of in school have a course on how do you how do you screen or how do you determine validity of postings. You know, this is something librarians have actually been teaching people to do for years. It comes down to this is information. It's bad information sometimes. It's good information other times. But I can't, you know, think of how many times I, I worked with, I would sometimes step out of the archival role and I'd work with, you know, English, the basic English courses where you taught them how to do research. You taught them, you know, to look at books, articles. 
And this is the same kind of thing, except we've now gone in a virtual environment. And yet all, a lot of public schools are, are letting their librarians, their media specialists go, and everybody thinks everything's on the computer. We don't need librarians anymore. So are you telling me there are books published with lies? <laughs> so this is, Are all peer-reviewed research papers legitimate? No. In fact, it was eye-opening to me recently that in one of the major science publications, something like 20 to 30 percent of peer-reviewed published papers were subsequently withdrawn. So it's not ever going to be a perfect world. It's not ever going to be a utopia. We know what the road to utopia is strewn with. The 20th century demonstrated that. There were several attempts to reach utopia. It's about 10 till. This is not an easy problem to solve, as I think we've determined. But I think everybody here has done a great job of contributing. One question I have for you what do you think of this format that we used for the discussion this year? If, it, if you think it's positive, please ra raise your hand. Okay. Opposite, raise your hand. Okay, because that's going to help determine how we format next year's discussion. Yes, Barb. You're on the board now. <laughs> Bring it to the board. Our first meeting next year. And before, you can send us an email, and we'll put that on the agenda. All right. Thank you very much for a wonderful year. Thank Tom, Tom Dietz again, president. Thank you, Tom. We'll be in touch over the summer and see you in September. Sorry, what about the name? Oh, yeah, please remember to turn in your name tags. Don't take it home with you.